and welcome to the Change Exchange. And uh, now we're talking change to Ferial Safaji, City Press editor, and a woman who's walked through some changes <laughs> and lived through some changes in this country, and yourself. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ruda. Nice to be with you. Where did the idea come from to be a journalist? You started out studying law. Mm. There was never anything else for me, really. So people always assume my first editing job was um, the Mail and Guardian, not so. I was the editor of the Green Times at my high school. Um, and I've always felt journalism to be a way that you can impact on your society and impact on your world. So growing up under apartheid, it was for me the most logical thing to become. And as a black woman mm. in that time, 60s, 70s, as a little girl, mm. could you see yourself as the boss? No, never ever. Um, I don't think that we as I mean, I live in a coloured area. Were ever schooled to think of ourselves as the boss? Um, I think that your life was very much ordained to become a school teacher or a bank clerk or a clothing worker. So really, it took understanding the struggle and aligning yourself with it to be able to paint a different dreamscape for yourself. Right? And did you do that? How Absolutely. Old were you? Um, I, I'm, I'm a Piscean, so dreaming comes pretty easily to me. Um, and understanding that your world could change if your country changed um, was the only way, I think, that enabled surviving through those times. Yeah? So what were your dreams? Mm. What, what did you see? Well, firstly, I wanted to get out of Boston, um, which is where I lived. I really felt a little bit imprisoned there. By, um, it wasn't a, a beautiful place. It was very concrete, um, not a lot that was lovely. So my parents would often take us to the zoo lake, and getting there, you would wind through beautiful places. And I think, oh, it would be so nice to live there, to have a swimming pool. Um, very childlike. And only later did I understand that actually it wasn't just a mistake, of course, my parents didn't work hard enough. It was a system that kept us imprisoned. Eh? Mm. You once told me a story about standing on your balcony oh, in Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And? So my Gmail um, e email address is still a picture of me on that balcony. Um, and because I was little, you'd look out through what almost felt like prison bars. And I did often feel, I think, as a little one, how am I going to get out of here? Yeah? And I used to watch my mom walking down this along, not even a park, it was really just an open field from the station coming home. So I keep that to remind me of where I come from, eh? and I must never forget that. Yeah. When did you go to university? What year was um, it? 1985. So even then, things were very constrained. Yeah, it was. Um, did you go to Wits? I went to Wits. I was now as, um, among the small quota of people who got into um, a, a formerly white university. Otherwise, I'd have had to go to UWC for coloreds or KwaZulu Natal, Durban West for, for Indians. But I got in there, and we were not, we, because we aligned ourselves with the liberation movement, we didn't take part in anything other than um, student politics. We chose not to be part of the chess society or the gym or swim um, because you weren't allowed to enjoy it. You were just there to learn because there was still a struggle um, unfolding. It was a very exciting time to be a student. It was the, um, the last push against apartheid, 1985, uh, various states of emergency. So I really learned a lot then. Huh? I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the major change in the country, can you remember where you were when F.W. made his speech? Absolutely. So I was at Fitz, and he made the speech. Um, I was working at Fitz, and we watched on the TV, and then all ran onto the streets in, in great celebration. Huh? Um, and Brompton was like an epicenter of unions and civil society organizations, loads of students. It just was a feeling of absolute elation. Huh? Could you imagine how the country was going to change? At that moment? Um, no, not at all. No? And I think it's been harder than we expected on that day. And also freedom took a lot longer to come, because from that day to the first election was a good five years. No? And those five years reporting it was a great honor, um, because you're almost part like being a midwife to to its birth. Eh? Yeah, I also felt that. You, way. Did you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It was yeah. the best time. Wasn't to it be a, a great time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you were very young. You were, what, 22 when you were one of the panel who did the first yes, interview I, I with Madeira? Yeah. 
And I had a very funny hairstyle. <laughs> what was it like? <laughs> um, the interview? No, the hairstyle. The hairstyle. Oh, it was kind of chic, short, because um, I've got very unruly hair. Um, and really, I wish it had been different, because that picture follows me. But anyway, the interview. <laughs> um, I was chosen at the SABC because they needed like the Rainbow Nation panel. Um, John Simpson, Friak Robinson, Tim Odisi, and I guess they needed a chick. Um, but then I, I was chosen to be part of it, and it was sincerely a highlight. Um, although I would ask him, like I think I've told you, very different questions now than I asked at the time. Huh? Um, How could one know? How could one know her? Huh? Um, and did it forge a bond with him? Not, not at all. I'm quite shy that way. So I didn't even ask for an aut autograph or a selfie. I don't know what they were called back then. Um, but I just covered him as any other journalist did. I was shy to get close to him, as I saw other people doing. And I wish, of course, that I'd used that space differently um, now. Huh? Yeah, but at 22, as you say, it's hard. Mm. It is hard. You started at the Weekly Mail, it was yes. then, in 91. Mm. Tell me about that newspaper at that time, because mm. it also it played a very specific role. Sure. Um, that newspaper at that time was in Anderson Street downtown, two blocks behind the Carlton Centre, um, again in another heartland, that time of NUMSA, of um, many organisations around the area. And we were the chosen paper of the liberation movements because of the state of the rest of the media. People didn't quite trust the SABC yet. Um, so it was a very exciting um, place to be. You would have a Joe Slovo popping in or a Chris Hani popping in, a Madiba even, even visited. And we were at the heart of the debates of what was going to be the shape of this country. Sadly, though, we spent a lot of that time covering the third force. Um, Flak class and the remnants of, of, of a vicious in the union movements in Cartagate. So it was also an, a time of elation, but a time of great fear and trepidation. And that paper was at the heart of that story. Yeah. So in 2004, mm. you became the editor. It was then the Mail and Guardian. Yes, that's right. Yeah. How did you experience that? You were quite young, first mm. female editor, first black editor. <laughs> Um, with a fair amount of disbelief, because my, my colleague and friend, Monli Makanya, was moving on, and he had um, pushed me to apply, and I think lobbied for me. And honestly, Ruda, I didn't at all see the editor as a female form. I assumed it was going to be Justice Malala, William Mervyn Gumede, um, maybe bring Muxin Williams across. I always imagined the figure of leadership as male. Um, so to, imagine, to, to be in that position and get the job, it was perfectly wonderful, but very, very daunting. Hmm? And do you think women lead differently? I don't know. Some of my colleagues will say I'm a ball bust. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I hope that I bring a certain traits of my own to, to my leadership role, which is to listen, very flat structure. I'm the only editor I know who doesn't have an office. I really try and believe in the open door, literally no door policy. Whether that's because of my gender or because of my upbringing, I'm, I'm not sure. But I do know that many people say it's different. Some like it, some don't. Some people like figure of authority. I'm not that person. Mm. Um, and has that, that, the shape of the boss in yes. your mind, has that changed now that you have, have walked that road? Of course. Um, I mean, I had to very early on accept it as a trailblazing role and take a position of leadership for other young women uh, to come into the industry because um, Paula Frey, Lakela Kaunda, the two women who first became editors, they left those roles <coughs> quite quickly. So I, I had to help change the shape of how we understand leadership. And that's why women leaders are very interesting to me. I study them and profile them a great deal because I do think um, that it's within our ability to reshape leadership and resh reshape economies as well. Huh? So what is it that you try and teach younger women coming through? I find you've got to teach them very basic lessons that power doesn't reside elsewhere. It's within you. I teach them that it's okay to speak up. Nothing's going to happen to you. Um, I, I try and teach them that you don't have to stick to the soft beats. You can do politics, you can do international stuff. 
one of the first huge debates I had at the uh, Mail and Guardian was whether we send a young Afrikaans journalist to Swaziland to cover the protest there. And all the men in the room said, no ways. You can't send a woman to Swaziland. I mean, it's the monarchy. But we did. And you have those things happening all the time. Yeah? How did she react when she came back? What was her, and I don't mean uh, her she's newspaper a, report. Yes. I mean, her, what kind of report did she give? I firmly believe that it's, if you have curiosity, tenacity, and empathy, those are the three prime qualities, not macho, um, mm. um, a macho um, visit at all. Huh? Why the move to City Press? How did that happen? Um, I realized that the Mail and Guardian is my um, love place, and I could have stayed there forever, probably, but I spent a whole lot of my time there, and I wanted to learn to do mass market journalism. So I'm comfortable with generations now. I could tell you about Kanye and Bartle. We finished here today. <laughs> um, but I do feel it's important to understand what makes our masses, our ordinary people tick, and how to tell big stories in a way that's not worthy. Not worthy? Um, worthy is a term that's used in journalism to describe boring. And I think we have to make things like education, health care, um, the social system, the, how politics happens, we have to make it as exciting and compelling as writing about generations um, or any of the number of things that people read. And that's what I think I've learned to do at City Press. Um, how has the, the content mm. of our newspapers changed? Because I have seen that happening. It's mm. much more graphic, it's much more kind of approachable. Sure. Mm -hmm. It has to have, because you and I get our information, I suspect, on phones or tablets, as do most South Africans today. The, day of the, the days of the 4,500 4, read, it's just not possible, except maybe on a Sunday or if we have some leisure. For most people, we're living like that, in an attention deficit economy where we have um, very short um, consciousness. And journalism has to follow that, um, to tell news, graphically, to tell it through pictures, through, to find different forms of storytelling. Are you also exploring a new audience, especially in South Africa, where people, I mean, there was such a huge percentage mm. of our people who didn't, who didn't read, mm. didn't grow up with newspapers? I think they're reading on phones. Oh. They're not reading newspapers, and they're reading um, what they want to read, and they're reading locally and foreign and from everywhere. It's an exciting but terrifying moment to be a journalism, to be a journalist, because no longer are you the broadcaster out. You're having to shape your agenda by what people are telling you all the time, every day. You changed, or under your mm. watch, um, City Press has gone from distinctly African mm. to what is your motto now? All the facts you decide. Yeah. Um, so I love distinctly African because I think it was making yourself part of a very exciting continent. But locally, it was being read as distinctly African black, for only for black people. And my mission, my brief from, from work, was to make it a paper for all South Africans, to make on-roads into it so that everyone felt comfortable um, reading it. Have we been successful? I'm not so sure, but we try. I think it's important that we don't have black media, white media any longer. What have you done? How does one do that? How does one shift that? Um, I think you've got to get a variety of voices and you must only confirm people's opinions or prejudices. It's nice to shake them up with things that make them angry and then we have a proper discussion and debate because really, I think one of the unfortunate but fortunate things is we have no easy consensus in South Africa mm -hmm. on anything from race to economic direction um, to looting. Was it xenophobia? Was it not? Um, there's no easy consensus, and I think a good journalism allows all of that to happen as we decide what our path is um, as a nation. I'm so aware of uh, that South Africa is not fixed yet. Mm. I mean, fixed in a pattern. Mm. Um, you know, the Brits don't even have a written constitution because everyone agrees that yes. this is the way we do things. Um, we don't agree on the first thing. Yeah. So. You have also chosen to be a very public face. You know, many editors, mm. especially print editors, kind of stay behind the scenes. Was that a conscious, conscious choice, and why? My instinct was to be quiet um, and to just edit quietly. 
Um, but the role was, was thrust upon me and I've, I've come to enjoy it and to learn how to put very unpopular opinions out there um, to create a different agenda. It's not always the easiest thing to do because you really can get people quite hit up. But I understand it as part of the shaping of what it is we're going to be. Personally, I think we're taking too long to decide, <laughs> much too long. It must be, it's hard when the, the responses then become personal. Yes, I've had many um, instances um, where I've upset my own religious community, Muslim people, where I've upset the rump of our readers, black um, middle class South Africans with publication of Painting of the Spear um, in Kandla and the coverage thereof has upset a whole lot of political leadership. Um, and attacks can get quite personal, but also I know that there's that they are a group of people who understand the importance of the media and society and who do support us to, um, to do what we do. Um, and are they not silent support? They're real. Huh? But how do you not, not take it on when it becomes personal? It's, I mean, by name, it's on uh, you or you as a person, as period, mm. not just City Press or the media. Um. I think you grow a tough skin um, <laughs> in, in my job. I've been doing it for um, 11 years now. And you must decide which voices you're going to listen to and learn. And some of it is just rough, tough, racist, macho stuff. I'm not going to do that. Eh? Mm. Um, when I had a different opinion on Zelda Lechranci's tweets uh, recently, the first thing uh, several people said back to me was, Kuli, um, and Really, it didn't the water of ducks back. It's, it's their idiocy, not, not mine. Eh? And how do you see, I mean, the, the million dollar question, how do you see the future of print media? Um, so I think print media will always be around. In the same way that successive waves of disruption haven't wiped out the most recent thing. So TV didn't obliterate radio. Radio didn't obliterate print. They will get, it'll get much smaller as an agenda setting mechanism because I think people are reading differently. Mm. They're reading on their technology, on their phones, on their tablets. Good journalism will survive even if print gets to be a tiny part of but what we do. how are we, we going to pay for it? Hmm? How are we going to pay for that good journalism? They aren't workable examples yet. And that we have to um, understand. I don't think it's going to be a commercial model. I think the future of journalism is non-profit. And that's something that a lot of us are working on very, very hard. What do you um, mean? We're going to get found have to get foundations and philanthropists to see journalism, um, public interest journalism, in the same way that you see healthcare, social justice, etc., um, and fund it that way off the books. Eh? We saw that in America. We lived in Washington yes. for four months recently, and very often at the end of a talk show. Of a, of a good in-depth mm. talk show, there is with thanks to the mm. Kellogg Foundation, sure. Coca-Cola, etc. Et yep. It's yeah. not something that you're comfortable with because I think it can harm independence, mm. but I do That's think it's the future. Balance. It's a highly difficult balance. Yeah. Uh, so we spent two days with some really uh, clever people um, two weeks ago where we began to think through how do you create distance between the money and the journalism. And that means an independent trust with leading figures in your society on it. But it's what we're going to have to do. Hmm? Fascinating. Mm. And Otherwise, all you read about Kim Kardashian, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what plans do you have? What do you want to do? Um, I want to write two books and do a study of the African middle class. I've come to a point in my life where I want to think a little more deeply about what we're going to be as a nation and where we're going to answer those questions because I get asked them a lot and make myself part of the voice of, of those voices saying, here's our scenario, here's what we could do. Huh? Two books? Yes. So the one on the African middle, or the black middle class and the other one? I'm shy to tell you the title, but I will. <laughs> so it's called um, What If There Were No Whites? And it's a look at our race debate. Um, and so if didn't come? Then what would have happened? Not really. <laughs> but even now, I think there's a debate in our society which believes falsely 
that if only we had all the stuff white have got, then everything would be cool. But actually, that's not true. And it's often a debate formed on very wonky foundations. Um, and I recognize it will be a, a difficult book to write, but I feel like the time is, is right for it. And what are you thinking? Is it is it your is it a kind of extended opinion piece, or do you want to? What do you what do you want no, to base it on? No, it's going to be based on sets of research which show um, which show how how much things have changed. So property, pension, provident fund ownership, um, how we're we doing. That's black people, um, and what must happen in the future. So very much research based, with some opinion threaded through it. Hmm? And have you started? Um, I've begun to assemble the material. Yeah. Mm. How do you find time for long-term big projects like that in the midst of a very busy career? Um, I Well, what I'm going to have to start doing is writing 2,000 words in the morning before um, I go to the office, and also getting that thing of, of a sabbatical and taking a bit of time off before I decide what I'm going to do next. A slightly lighter topic. Yes. Tell me about your home, about where you are. Okay, so I live halfway between, I live in two places. My mom's home is in Mayfair, where I grew up. Mayfair being that place in the middle of where all the people, the Somalians who got looted ran to. So it's that place. It's filled with Somalians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, the new immigrants. I find it quite exciting. Also, I fight a lot civic battles there because it's dirty. And it's an interesting area, but it's becoming grimy and run down. So that's still what I call my community. My home, where I go for runs and have family, and my dog is in Parkhurst. Yeah? Um, and I like that because now we're going to go off the grid. Um, we're going to be powered by different means. And also, we're going to be the first with fiber to the home. So quick downloads and wonderful television, I hope. <laughs> yeah. What makes your house your home? You said your dog is there. My dog, uh, my niece, uh, a student who lives with me. But it's also um, my quiet place, my thinking space. Eh? My dream is to add a yoga studio sometime. How do you, how do you create a quiet space? What do you physically put mm. there? As I've hit my 40s, I found that you actually you have to. So photographs and then just a, a uh, a physical quiet. I play loud music sometimes, but it's the garden's nice. There's a herb garden and a veggie garden I'm busy doing, and all of those give me great um, contem contemplative moments, which I find myself more in need of. What sold the house to you in the first place when you saw it? It was cheap. <laughs> 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 no, it was. It was one of the few that was still under my uh, my budgeted amount. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, you Ruda. You're the very best. You're in a very, very interesting space. Thank you very much, Ruda. Lovely to chat.